You are tuned to KFUG Crescent City. I'm Mike Thornton. This is Public Process, five minutes past the top of the hour. Looks like a really nice day out there today. And we're glad you're with us because we have Crescent City Police Chief Ivan Minsel in the studio with us. Chief Minsel, thanks for being with us today on Public Process. Uh, good afternoon, and good afternoon to your uh, radio, li- radio listening audience out there. So I hope everything is going well wherever you are. Yeah, absolutely. And I am really glad that you are able to be with us. Chief Minsel was, I think, the first guest on this iteration of Public Process. And you're going to be retiring here pretty soon. Yes, I'm looking forward to a new life. Uh, you know, I've been here for almost five years. But in the law enforcement business, I've been committed to public service for 38 years. So September 8th is my 38th year, almost to the minute. Um, And I will retire, hang up my badge, pass it on to the next chief. And my wife and I are looking forward to seeing the beautiful Northern California and Southern Oregon and all the things it has to offer from a new new set of lenses. You you may actually be able to go and do something and not have to have like 70% of your mind focused on what's going on in Crescent City while I'm out here trying to have some fun. Oh, absolutely. I'm looking forward to a new life. My wife's ecstatic. She's been waiting for this for a long time. I bet she is. There's a lot going on in the world, and uh, we're going to see it from another another set of lenses. So we just celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary. So the boss says it's time to do something different. <laughs> well, congratulations on your anniversary. Thank you. So, Chief, let, let, let's talk if we can. I, I, can we can we kind of take a look back at your law enforcement career? I now that you've put all of these years into it and into public service, and, and in my opinion and in the opinion of many people I've talked to, I think you are the epitome of a law enforcement public servant. So looking back at that career, what are some of the, what are some of the highlights and the challenges that you've experienced as a law enforcement officer in California? Well, challenges, that's probably a little simpler. Okay. Only because, you know, law enforcement changes every day. Every day, uh, things change, laws get created, they get through our legislature, our executives sign into it, whether it be a city ordinance, a state law, or, you know, federal law. And law enforcement adapts to that. You know, law enforcement does not make the laws. They may ask for an opinion, we may weigh in on something, but at the end of the day, another part of government does that. We enforce the law. You know, when I started out 38 years ago, marijuana was a serious crime in the possession of it, smoking, that kind of thing, being under the influence. Today, uh, through the act, through science, you know, medical marijuana, they has some some significant values to people with different illnesses. Uh, you know, recreational now than it wasn't then, or at least it wasn't then legal then. It's legal now, so things have changed. Uh, Drunk driving was considered, uh, you know, you took somebody home or stuff. Today, that's an extremely serious crime. People go to jail. You know, they've committed murders and things, driving behind the wheel. So our legislators and in, in our, in our government at all levels make laws that, that respond to the needs of the people, and law enforcement enforces those. We sometimes get asked our personal opinion, but we do get our ask our professional opinion and, and how that will go about to be done. Facing Crescent City, as most of the western part of the United States right now, we are going through, we're coming up on a year of this new Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals regarding homelessness, public property, and all those things. And we've worked through it here in Crescent City. So it's not an easy task, but like every community out there, we work through it, and we got going to make everybody happy. But we try to keep the peace, respect everybody's rights, and and get through the day so everybody can get through the day and do whatever they they do in the day. So let let me ask a question that that may be a little bit out on the edge, okay? And 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 I'll ask you f- to address it from your personal opinion informed by your long professional experience because you brought up two issues, marijuana and drunk driving. And I and I'm and I'm old enough to remember where 
a single joint of marijuana could give you a substantial prison sentence. You're absolutely right. A, a seed, a seed. Right. Everybody in the car went to jail, Everybody, the, including the car. That's <laughs> right. And drunk driving when it was not uncommon at all for a law enforcement official to simply say, I will follow you home. To, you, 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 yeah, I'm not saying you ever did that. I'm just saying I know that that has happened in some jurisdictions. Those things have radically changed now. As you look back, what are some of the things that the lawmakers got right and some of the things they got wrong? Well, when it came to drunk driving, you know, they considered it a social thing. You know, you got home. How did he get home? Now, it, it's a seriousness. You know, I've seen families of four completely get killed. Oh, absolutely. In fact, I've seen them when I worked uh, a number of assignments. I've seen drunk driving from a personal sense, and I've seen it as a professional. Don't drink and drive. I don't care how old you are. Don't drink and drive. Things we got right, domestic violence. You know, there was a time... Uh, Police were very powerless. You know, we kept the peace. We, you know, we told the guy to leave. And, and, and I say, but we're talking back in the 70s, right. you know, in the 80s when I started. You know, we'd tell the, the male part. Usually it was a male, female, the male part. Hey, can you go sleep at a friend's house? Can you do the Laws have changed. I started domestic violence at the beginning. And they, the legislature, through a number of advocates who, who got out there and said, hey, this is terrible. We need to fix this. And they've done it, and they've done a good job, and it's evolving. And even today in 2019, domestic violence is a serious problem, and we're working through it. And it's, it's been expanded to domestic partners, to children, everybody inside. So it, it's something we need to fix. I don't know if we have the capability to fix it, but we do, we do the best we can here in Crescent City, like every law enforcement agency does. But I don't know if we can fix it as a society. I hope we do. It, it touches everybody. So they're on the right track, and yeah, they're doing it right. Yeah, the, the reason I'm, I'm asking some of these things is because a lot of decisions, and, and once again, you know, I, I think you were very clear that as a professional law enforcement officer, whatever rank you were at any given point in your career, people made laws, they passed laws, those things became law, and they said, now it is your job to enforce them. And your job was to enforce them in a, you know, non-biased, constitutional, effective and efficient manner. And I just think of the various things that have changed over that time. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I'm thinking like in terms of things like three strikes. People went, we want these habitual criminals off the street. Now we're seeing that we have got a gigantic geriatric prison population. Do, do, you, do you know what I mean? And yeah, I, so, and, you know, law enforcement is just a part of that. Right. The, the, the correctional part, the rehabilitation, that's another segment of law enforcement. And uh, the, the police side, whether it be police or sheriff or highway patrol, we make those arrests. We go to court. You know, the district attorney or a city attorney presents those cases and a judge or a jury or, or both make a decision as to guilt or innocence and then a penalty. And then it shifts over. If they're guilty and there's a penalty, they go to a county jail or to a state prison. And, and those are the parts that are evolving. That We spend a lot of energy in that, resources. Um, and California has always been at the forefront of leading it. We did three strikes. We did one strike. Then we shifted a little bit to uh, decriminalizing things, try to treat a problem versus a, the symptom kind of a thing. And we've seen a lot of that with substance abuse. Uh, we saw the passage of Prop 47, which decriminalized a number of things. We saw the Proposition 57 come about. And of course, AB Assembly Bill 109, which, re which reduced prison overcrowding, which, which was a problem and shifted it and focused more on rehabilitation, education, those kind of things. Not an easy process for anyone, uh, by surely not a cheap process in trying to get people to change how they do business, how they act in our community. And then 
you know, the other part of all that treating that that symptom I talked about, you know, sometimes we have mental illness in there, subject, uh, substance abuse, addiction, those things are impacted uh, by the professionals who go out and, and try to correct that. Not an easy task for those professionals. My hat's off to them, but it is a team effort. Law enforcement is the first ones, are usually the first responders, but it's a team that puts together. District attorneys, city attorneys, the courts, correctional institutions, medical institutions, all of that together to somebody can come out the other end and be a, a, a good member of society. We're speaking with... Crescent City Police Chief Ivan Minsel, who's going to be retiring in just a couple of weeks. Couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. You are tuned to KFUG Crescent City, 1215. I'm Mike Thornton. This is Public Process. So, Chief, excuse me, Chief Minsel. Excuse me. I'm having one of those days. I hear you. Yeah. So, okay. So, I, I, I'm looking to kind of get some insight from you i'm sure what i have i don't uh, have a lot you well you, you you do and 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 the, so i'm so all of these things go on in the legislature in the community in the city hall in the county board of supervisors and i don't mean like specifically crescent city or specifically down north all of these different things are happening in the communities and people are making decisions and and police officers are very often, I assume, sitting there going, hmm, what are we going to do with that? And I'm just curious, you know what I mean? When, when it's just the cops <laughs> you know, well, who are talking to each other, you know? Well, we call that roll call, you know? <laughs> and, and, you know, we'll have that discussion. We'll have a new policy and procedure come down on how we're going to enforce a new law how are we going to interact with that how it's going to affect law enforcement and the day-to-day -day operations you know is it going to be a priority thing is it going to be at the other end of the scale so all that is decided you know in in the you know at the ch chief of police office the the command center whatever that may be in various jurisdictions but we figure out how we're going to enforce the law it's not just as simple of just go out and enforce the law we have to train people because especially if it's something new you know all laws have something in common that's called the elements of a crime and if the elements of the crime aren't there you don't have a crime so we have to understand what those elements are and be able to recognize them piece them all together and then make an informed opinion, which actually leads to an arrest. And then that goes to the next level, which would be a district attorney or a city attorney. And they will decide whether or not we have the elements of the crime. We had that probable cause to arrest. And then, you know, they decide if they can take it to court. And then, then it goes through the process again. The judge or jury or both take a look at all that. And, of course, the defense gets to argue the points that it wasn't there and one side will say it was there and then witnesses come by and the, and the rest you see, you know, just another case of, of Perry Mason or Law and Order or something. But really, at the, at the law enforcement level, we have to understand what we're enforcing. We don't get a magic wand and, you know, and a breath of, of fresh air comes through and says, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is the new law of the land and we're going to do it. It takes a little preparation, and we make sure the elements are understood, the officers understood what their responsibility is, so we can go out and do the best job possible. And those are the expectations at the bottom and every day of our public. And realizing that what I'm going to ask you now is a completely different jurisdiction in a completely different state. I'm thinking about the recent developments out of New York related to the Eric Gardner case and the eventual firing of the police officer there and that the police officers union is publicly expressing that they feel law enforcement is under siege, that um, that law enforcement is being unfairly attacked is there a sense within the broader law enforcement community that those things are are happening? Does that make sense what I'm asking you? Yes, I don't know the specifics of the New York case. Well, and I'm not. Uh, and, and, and let me to answer your question. Please, but yeah, w police are 
an extension of the government where those first responses were an expansion, an extension of a community. You know, community policing, you've heard me talk about that many times, starts with the community. And the police are those full-time professionals get paid to go out and do that 24 hours, seven days a week. When you're home at Christmas morning, they're out on the street. And, and then when you're home at midnight asleep, they're out doing their thing, patrolling. But, yeah, are we affected by all those things? And they're sometimes... We're human. We screw up. We make mistakes. We didn't do our job as well as we thought we did. And I'm not talking about evil. I'm not talking about some pre-plan because that is wrong. That's always wrong. But we're human. We make mistakes. Uh, and we go out. And that's why it's important for officers, deputies, administrators to be as connected as we can with the community. Because we do make a mistake. We go out there. I can tell you if I had my way, the, the city council would be, you know, writing checks for me to do a lot of super duper stuff for the Crescent City Police Department. But that's not physically possible. They give me as much support as they can. They have a lot of other things on their plate. Same thing with the sheriff's department just here at home. Uh, so we make do with the resources we have and we do the best job we, we can. And that's what's important. Now, are we personally touched by the events that, that go around the world? Are we touched when an officer is killed in a line of duty and their family has to move on without their loved one? Yes. This year alone, we've had close to 75 officers killed in a line of duty, whether by gunshot, traffic, or, or other means. Uh, you know, last year there was uh, over 100, almost 150 something. We die in the line of duty. We're those first responders, but we still come. It doesn't matter. We don't take a day off. We don't take a few days off for morning. We get back in that patrol car, and we go out and do our job. Uh, that's a tough thing to do. So, yeah, sometimes we screw up. Absolutely. Right, and I guess where I'm, where I'm, where I'm trying to get with this is in, in, in my world, I hear a lot from the people who are – Accusing the police as a whole, okay, not you or any specific officer, of conscious and or unconscious racial bias that manifests itself in overly aggressive and in some cases fatal encounters, particularly with men of color. So I hear a lot of that side. What I don't hear much is what law enforcement is saying to itself about these issues. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Yeah. As I understand your question, to best answer this is nobody goes out in the morning or whenever you start your watch, you go out today, I'm going to go out and violate somebody's rights. You know, that's not what the department would say. That is not what officers think, but there are some there are some people who who are prejudiced. There are some people, and that's the human race. Right. We've got, and it just because you're a police officer doesn't mean you're exempt from that. Do we see the worst of people? Yes. Do we see? Are we angry at, at what people do to other people? Yes. But we are trained to to control that. To, to, to maintain that. You know, there's a lot of us, you know, high suicide rate, high divorce rate, all that stuff because we have those pressures. But what's important here to understand is we took an oath to go out and enforce the law. If, if somebody came on this job or in law enforcement job, just says, I'm going to go out and kill X or beat up Y or something, the system failed because we let that person join. Nobody comes on to department, law enforcement department, to be a crook, to hate people, want to go out and kill people, but they may at some time go sideways. We're human. And those people need to be identified and need to be taken out of the process. The process is designed to work and to protect people and to serve people. Does that always work? Does that always happen? No. There, There's anomalies. There's screw-ups. Um, in 38 years, I've seen my share of Decisions gone wrong, who were, who were good decisions. I've seen evil people do evil things who just happen to have a badge, and, and those were people were removed. We're human, and as long as we recruit from the human race, we're going to get human race results. We're speaking with Crescent City Police Chief Ivan Minsell. You're tuned to KFUG Crescent City. 
101.1 on your FM radio dial, worldwide on the internet, kfugradio.org. This is Public Process. I'm Mike Thornton. You know, I I, I jokingly say it to people, and I I may have said it to you at one point. You know, I I wasn't always this semi-well-adjusted great-grandfather that I appear (laughs) to be today. And and so I, I know from personal experience and proximity experience that police quite often see the worst of what human beings can do to each other and to themselves. What's it like going home after a day of that? Well, you know, for for 30 some odd years, or 33 and a half years, I used to have a long commute. So that was my decompressing time. Turn on the news, see what's going on in the world, listen to the latest music, think about, so there was a time to transition. So when I got home, I didn't want to lash out at my wife or, or go lock myself in the corner or, or do all those defensive things to unwind. So that was my transition time. That was my unwinding time. So when I got home, I was Ivan. I wasn't Officer Mensel or Sergeant Mensel or Chief Mensel. I was Ivan, her husband. I was the father to my son. So they got to see me there. Yeah, occasionally it rubbed off. Occasionally I, I couldn't get rid of it all. You know, you see terrible things and it, you just don't forget it it sticks with you you see things injustices you know where you've done everything you can do and, and yet the bad guy still goes free and that wears on you that's that leaves scar tissue but my wife and my son didn't didn't sign on to take a piece of that right? i did right so you you got to manage that and you got to manage it well in the in the and it's tough and in in Suicide and, and high divorce rate and dysfunctional families is a part of our world. I've been fortunate. Um, my wife's very tolerant. <laughs> she's she's corrected me a couple times, and she's been a good mentor. Uh, that's probably why we're still together. <laughs> so I, I share that is uh, leave it at home. You know, we I grew up in the law enforcement community and one thing they always FTO which was my field training says that badge you know when we get it for the first time it looks like a gigantic Roman shield it's going to protect you from everything but in reality you know it's about three and a half inches maybe four on the long side and leave it in your locker so in in that metaphorically is that a good word I leave that in that whole process in that locker so when I leave when I get home I'm Ivan you know, I got a fence to, to build, I got uh, firewood, you know, I'm playing softball with my son, you know, all those kind of things. That's what becomes important. That keeps me, my humanity, my, my realistic approach to the world, see the world through another lens. So when I come back to work the next day, I put that badge on, I'm more rounded, I'm healed, up, I'm good. And I go out and I give that, can understand that, and I can share that feeling with the people I encounter. And, and, and I'm thinking a little bit about, you know, the reverse process of that, the coming to work, right? Because, and, and, and so, so I, um, I used to do work, um, I worked for a county government, I worked in a mental health department, I ran drug rehab programs. And part of what I did was I was on the drug court team, right? So I'm on the drug court team with the DA and a couple of the judges and all of that. And there was one judge. And so we're back, you know, in the room, and he's laughing and he's choking. He's telling all these different funny stories. A great guy. And then he goes out in the court and he sits behind the bench and he becomes this totally different person, right? Just stoic, stone-faced. And I don't mean like bad. I don't mean like, you know, but he's just, you could tell he's put on a totally different persona that apparently he can put on and take off. Does that make sense? I mean, it, absolutely. You know, I mean, is that similar? That's very similar. And you know, it's whether you be a doctor, uh, an attorney, a judge, coppers, senators, maybe even the president. I don't know. But when you come home to your family, you're not in any of those titles. If you're the person. You're part of that. Your dad, your husband, your uncle, your brother, whatever. You're not in any of those other titles. So. They see you in a different light. You come home, you have a bad day, you work through it. When I go out in the public, when I'm the chief of police, I go out, I, they have expectations of me to be the chief of police. You know, not to see me sucking down, you know, my 18th beer or 
or anything. <laughs> that would like. not be good. So, you know, they, they expect me to be there 24 7. You know, I remember one time I was in Brookings having dinner with my wife, and somebody from Crescent City saw me, and, and they had a problem. And they wanted me, their chief, their law enforcement person, to help them with their problem. So I'm in the middle of my meal, you know, and I'm doing the best I can to work through this, you know, try not to alienate this person, not to alienate my wife. And, and, I, and, and you're doing this. Sometimes they, they blend together, you know, and that's where cops sometimes get in trouble, both physically and administratively, when they, when they don't do well to blend. So when I'm out in the public, I always try to remember that people are always watching uh, as a chief or a lieutenant or a captain or something, you're a little bit more high profile. John Q's officer, and you're out and about doing whatever. Bigger communities, you kind of get lost in the crowd. Here in our community, right. everybody knows who everybody is. So all our officers, you know, we, we have a high expectation of them, and they honor that because when they don't, People will call and let you know. We're speaking with Ivan Minsel, Crescent City Police Chief. This is Public Process, KFUG Crescent City. So two things, Chief. One is, I mean, and I was actually saying this to somebody else the other day. I, I don't, I cannot remember another law enforcement official who took as consistent and a public stand related to the constitutional rights of poor and homeless people as I've seen you do in this community. And, and sincerely, I mean that. I, have, I, 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 I wish more would do it. That's my opinion. I've seen you do that on numerous occasions. And that leads me to this. I also have seen people be very critical of you for those kinds of things. I think they're wrong. What is it like being a chief or a law enforcement professional in general, particularly in a small town, when you have people making these broad pronouncements about things that you know that they don't know what the heck they're talking about. I mean, what's what, what's dealing with that like? I mean, I, I'm assuming it's what's it what's it like? It could be challenging. Yeah. My responsibility to my community is to educate them as best I can, and those who have everybody's entitled to their opinion, and they I present them the facts of what the position is in law enforcement. And then they take them and decide what they want to keep and what they want to throw out and what they want to twist. I have no control over that. The control I have is that I follow the law. There is a process. And I, I respect everyone's rights. In the Constitution, it doesn't say anything about if you're homeless, you have less. If you're a multi-billion zillionaire, you have more. It doesn't say any of that. What it says is everybody's treated the same. It says everybody has the same rights. You know, when I read that little card that says you have the right to remain silent, that doesn't mean if you're homeless you have to talk, and if you're a millionaire and you, and you don't have to talk. What it says, you have a right uh, to remain silent. It doesn't say anything about your financial background or your social class or any of those things. All those things are important because I took an oath. Law enforcement takes an oath, just like the elected officials. We took an oath to defend the Constitution. It's not about personal choice. It's not about what I like today and I'm going to do it today and not going to do it tomorrow. Those kind of it is. I took an oath that I would uphold the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of California. And that's the oath. And that's what's in the Constitution. That's what I'm duty bound. Because when I don't, I cease to be a law enforcement officer and, and I become ineffective. The standard for all law enforcement is we enforce the law under the constitutions. And there are people who agree or disagree, and that's fine. I have no problem with that. What I get upset with is when they start to hurt other people uh, physically. They can yell and scream. That's called the freedom of, of, of the press, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, all those great things. Those are all the rights. I will protect that. If, if you're walking down the street here with a group of individuals and you're protesting something that everybody else hates, my job is to protect your rights and the rights of everybody else. And I've done that. All I wish is people would be a little bit more understanding and say, you know, they have a right to do that. I disagree with them. 
And that's where they have an ability to talk to their legislators who maybe they can change the law if that's practical or not. It may not be because that thing called the courts, they decide at the end of the day whether that law is constitutional or not under the framework of our constitutions. A lot of moving parts. So just I ask people to go back to that history 101, government 101, and take a look at all that stuff and explain that to the younger people so they can make more educated guesses or, or better decisions. That would be great. So they understand what we do and don't do and why. Because it, it's not always easy to explain those things when you're out there taking care of business. Well, and, you know, I mean, I, I this is just, this is me talking. I mean, I know it's so difficult to tell my voice from Chief Ivans, but, you know, this is me talking. Because I... <laughs> I don't know that it should always be your responsibility as chief of police to be out and trying to explain those things to some people. I think there are other people who should be trying to explain those things as well, including some of our local elected officials. And I, I'm not sure all of them understand <laughs> that everybody has the same rights under the Constitution. Well, it's my job to enforce the law, and that's to protect people's rights. And if I can educate people, if I do one, I see that as a success. If I do more than one, I see that as a greater success because the more educated my community is, the better my community is. And that's how I look at it. The better our police department will be because we'll have a better educated community. A lot of people won't agree with what we have going on. I know there's a lot of people frustrated on both sides of the aisle, on both sides of the equation. I get that. I, my job is to keep the peace and let people go at the proper forum to let that anger out, let that disappointment out, let that difference of opinion out, whatever it may be, there's a forum for that. And, and I direct them to that if they ask for, the, for an opinion or direction. But my job is to keep the peace so, and, and, and show them the way to go out and change that. And a lot of groups are doing that, and some aren't. Uh, those that tend to break the law or, go, or, or want to do that, that's what we deal with law enforcement. It doesn't matter if it's in our community or anywhere in the country. But if you go out and lawfully to protest or uh, petition or do whatever you got to do, those are your rights, and I will protect them just like every officer will. We're speaking with Crescent City Police Chief Ivan Minsel. You are tuned to KFUG Community Radio, 101.1 on your FM radio dial worldwide on the internet, kfugradio.org. So, so, Chief, addressing homelessness seems to be one of the big fault lines in this community. Would you agree with that when it comes to how people think law enforcement should be dealing with it? Yes, but it, 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 it's, we're not unique. You know, I read, I read a lot about what's going on in our state mm -hmm. and homelessness, on auto theft, on crimes. That's how we learn. That's how we better serve our community. And it's frustrating everywhere. My home city is, is in turmoil right now. That's the city of Los Angeles. I was born there. Right. I lived there for a number of years. And reading some of that, it's, they're in turmoil. They're really struggling about this issue. As are many communities and, throughout and it, the state. Throughout the state and throughout the country. It's not unique. Uh, if you go to, you know, our neighbors to the north, you know, Portland is, is being challenged in Seattle. If you go to New York, uh, they're, they're being challenged. And our nation's capital is being challenged. Homelessness is, you know, economic hardship on people, substance abuse, mental health, uh, a vicious cycle that's going on and there are those who step forward to help break that cycle that cycle of of, of life um, some are engaged some will, are just comfortable with that and they'll live that forever i ran across a person here in crescent city that's had this lifestyle for 35 years he's very comfortable with it he readjusted to it and others who just they were doing well and life went very wrong very sideways and they're forced in the situation. So you help everybody that you can help and those that to help themselves and, and there to you the success. So the biggest challenge for our community is resources and, and there are those out there, both our political officials or our department heads are, are working towards uh, securing grants, opening up programs, developing programs, the nonprofits, and of course our, our, our faith-based uh, institutions, the churches, the ministers, the pastors, the priests, everybody who who's in that arena, they're doing their best too. It's not an easy problem to solve. 
uh, requires a lot of thought and a lot of different to connect to different people. And they're all doing the best they can, um, including the police. You know, we go out there and, and we ensure that people keep rights here. But you'd be surprised that people call and ask us for directions or advice or insight or something. Sometimes they just ask for a, for a buck for a hamburger because they haven't <laughs> eaten in three days. You know, it happens. You know, we direct them to places where we can, they can get some help. And sometimes, you know, you, you get a letter back or you get a call back. And I got that from a person who says, you know, thanks for taking a chance. You know, I'm doing well, you know, and that to me is, is, is golden. Sure. Absolutely. I, I can I can imagine because I mean, I would think that those are are pretty rare compared to the problems part of it, you know, because I mean, that's you and your other fellow officers. I mean, as, as we said earlier in this, I mean, you're you're put in the position of very often dealing with human beings at their worst, doing the worst things that they can do to each other. So having those kinds of things, I would imagine must be pretty gratifying. Oh yeah, you know, some of the best rewards I've gotten in 38 years was just someone come up and say, thanks for, for coming. You know, I look at it as a job, I look at it as a profession, it's been my life. So, but occasionally someone will reach out and tell you, hey, you know, you made the difference. You know, I remember a time and this is back when I was just a young officer and PCP was a big deal in South Central LA. I remember PCP. And, you know, we got to this family and, and they were tormented by this drug and we, we my partner and I, and we, we worked through it. And my partner and I had different opinions on how to handle the problem, both right, but both different. And we compromised on how to do this and we worked in, so we worked through this problem with this family and you know about four or five days later we both got a call from one of the family members who just said hey so-and-so is doing well and we wanted to thank you for showing us away that made our day we went out and had a cup of coffee and the day the rest of the day was great <laughs> so that, that was a success story you know and occasionally you get a call like that you know occasionally someone will write a letter or, or which are all great but you know that simple personal touch is always the best and you know i've had a few of those over the years and, and letters and cards and things here in crescent city it's been great i uh, I remember a lady called and she was in trouble and we helped her out and she sent a card to the station just to say thank you that she was doing well so you know we keep those things you know we're not uh, it's not the medal of valor we're not you know you know charging up san juan hill or anything like that it was those little things it's the little everyday things that make that that's public service when people stop us and say, I'm, I'm stuck in the corner of walk and don't walk and I need to get here. Can you help me? Yeah, we can do that. Or we can get you help or we can do whatever. That's what, that's the part about community policing, but more importantly, that's public service. That's what I took an oath for. Is it easier to do that in a smaller community than it is in a big city like LA? Well, I think it's the both, you know, here I get to know them more, you know, if they're, they hang around a little bit long, you know, kind of work with them a little bit. Los Angeles had a lot more resources. So it's a blend, you know, we kind of have those chronic people who kind of pop up from time to time that they're in both communities. But, uh, you know, the big city had a few more resources. Here we've had a, a, a few more personal contacts where people have jumped out and done things, you know, where we're multiple hats, you know, what's nice is, I can call somebody in the county that I know by first name as opposed to somebody uh, by position and say, hey, I got, we're stuck here on walk and don't walk, can you help us? Yeah, and they can call out to me and we've done that. And that, that's the nice thing about our small community is it's, it's more personal. So we personally, we can help someone succeed. You, you've used a phrase and I'm gonna remember it because I think it's really good, stuck on the corner of walk and don't walk. What does that really mean when you say that? Well, it's an impasse where you're making decisions or, or not making the decision or, you, you know, you're, you're deciding or trying to decide, more importantly, trying to decide, how do I get out of this predicament I'm in? You know, it, it's, it's, it's a place, you know, we've all been faced with challenges. We've all been faced with problems that we've tried. So it's kind of a universal phrase I use that, People are stuck at the crossroads of, of some dilemma, and how do we fix this? So I gave it a name, and, and I use that to share with people that 
which direction do you want to go? These, this is what happens if you go this way. This is what happens if you go that way. Make a decision, and, and we'll see where we go with it. So that's important. So people can still have control over their lives. You know, you know, we're not going to let them go out and hurt themselves. We're not going to let them break the law. But, we're not, but we do want them to go out and be successful, go out and be prosperous, however they define that. And, and give them that opportunity if we can. You know, and, and if it's just saying, hey, go up the street and turn left or, you know, hey, if you go that way, you know, that's a dead end. You're going to end up making a U-turn. So and this may not be a direct correlation. So I'm going to try to ask it and be clear what I'm trying to get to. So I, that, I, I like that phrase. That makes a lot of sense to me. So what's the internal version of that when you're a police officer and you come into a situation and it's half this and half that? I mean, I, I guess in the end, I mean, the law is the law, and I understand that point. But within that framework, it's this, it's that, it's, you know, I, I, could, I could do this one or two or three or five ways. Does that make sense what I'm asking? We do get stuck between walk and don't walk. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You made it a lot easier than I was making it. Well, yeah, we get every situation, every call for service, every encounter, it's a different situation you know it's not unique that you know we have 10 of these in a row they have similarities but every person we encounter or come across has a different outlook has a different approach a different set of values whatever it may be and we try to address that we respect that we try to honor that and we try to assist them with with that whatever it may be so they can get out to do and and be successful in whatever they want to do and we also don't allow them to, you know, I don't want a successful burglar. I don't want a successful thief. What <laughs> right. I want is a successful community member. So we want to allow them to do that. And, and if that means we need to take them to jail, that's what we do until they can change their behavior or somebody in, in, the, in the, the justice uh, environment will do that, whether it be our district attorney, you know, prison, jail, whatever it may be. But you know, we allow people that opportunity to go do things. Now, is everything crystal clear? Nothing's crystal clear in my business. You know, um, we deal with people, and people, I'll use another phrase, we're kind of squishy. We yes. Can, we can kind of move around, you know? It's nothing's ever, it's not like building a bridge or, or building the, you know, uh, a water system, you know, where you, you, okay, that's a right angle and that's a 45 degree angle and, you know, that's a left thread to right turn, you know, those kind, nothing that simple. Every person's different. So you have to be flexible and understanding. And sometimes, you know, you get that quote, that, that bias you get in there you get a little worn out you get a and you need to go back and get retrained retuned up re recalibrated so you don't get into a rut you don't get into a, a habits of doing terrible things because sometimes you don't even know you're doing it right and, and that's you know you've done it for so long it becomes automatic so that's why we go back and california is very strict about that we're required to go back to, we do 24 hours in, in a year in training for in a two-year cycle and in Crescent City, this last year, we, we had 100%. And that's just the minimum. That We do a lot of extra stuff, you know. And it's not all, you know, shooting and, you know, running around. And, and it, it, we do law. We do uh, cultural awareness. We do first aid. We look at some new crime trends and how to investigate. A new law coming out, you know. Big thing about use of force now. The state has come out with some new guidelines and new laws, which are guidelines, which post, which is the licensing person in the right. state and uh, they're going to focus on training so training for the next couple of years is going to be real intense on how to change this concept for use of force because our state believes this is a better way to do it and we in law enforcement support that so we're looking better to make not only the officers the suspects but our community feel safer about law enforcement as a community and that's what's really important here is so we don't get into this we're we going to have glitches we're always going to have glitches we're we're talking about human race again people but as a community we can be strong and we can all work together well that that leads me to a, a question that i i wanted to ask and, and and once again i mean in general my understanding is that if there's such an average when it comes to the thing is an average when it comes to training that 
shooting basically was like eight times more than de-escalation, that there was a real overbalance on that. A, is that true? And, and B, is that what's shifting now under this new kind of edict from the governor? Well, you know, I don't know because, you know, one thing I read in there, and I came from the LAPD, and, you know, we've always in, embraced de-escalation. Here at Christmas, well, not always, but... Well, we always have. Now, has it always worked? No. But, but is it part of what we get trained in? Yes, okay. there. And what is it that we talk about here in Roll Call at Crescent City? What we get trained on is de-escalation. And, and, and sometimes you have to escalate. What comes in as a, contention, as a casual encounter becomes a reasonable suspicion. It becomes a probable cause. And those are things that for, for real legality. Now, we encounter a person and they want to fight. Well, it's kind of hard to say, hey, stop. You know, don't hit me and when the guy's trying to kill you or, or beat you up. So you're verbalizing, you're telling them to stop, and you're trying to control them. Because as officers, we have the use of force policy. The suspects don't. Right. They get to take the, the, the whatever, and, and we meet that challenge. And, and that's the difference in, in our world. We have the rule book, and we are very strict with it. The bad guys don't. Well, so let me let me ask this, and, and it's 1251. Will having more, and, and I'm not talking about, you know, any individual chief or any individual department, but in general, will having more of an emphasis on de-escalation be helpful, do you think? Oh, absolutely. And we de-escalate because we're putting a label on it. it it's becoming more common knowledge, but it's always been there. You know, whether you're a big department or a little department, Nobody goes out and says, I want to fight today. I want to get my uniform tore up. I want to go to the hospital. I want oodles and oodles of paperwork. Again, if you, go to, if you come to work thinking that, you're in the wrong profession, and we hired the wrong person. You come to work to make a difference, an impact to somebody's life positively. That's what we want. Now, we have a rule book, and use of force is part of that rule book, and we have to go through it. You know, deadly force is a serious thing. We've taken someone's life, just like we've taken someone's property or someone's liberty. You know, those are the things that law enforcement get to do. A lot of people forget that, but we're very strict about how we do that, and you want us to be. State of California is, is very progressive in law enforcement, and they're putting, again, they're reaching out again. You know, there's a trend, it's whatever, but it's they're out there and they're doing the right thing. So we, in, we embrace that, we support that, and we're looking forward to the training and the retraining. But, but more importantly, we're already working at here at Crescent City. We talk about de-escalation. We talk about use of force. We talk about pursuits and, and encounters. It's part of training, everyday training, just like physicians, just like you. Hey, what's going on today and what's not going on today? Right. And that machine's working well and that machine's not. We come in and we discuss the, the events of the day, what's going on tomorrow and what we learned from yesterday. We're speaking with Crescent City Police Chief Ivan Minsell. This is a public process on KFUG. Chief Minsell, we're just about out of here for the day. Has a new person been hired? No. Uh, Mr. Eric Weir, our city manager, and our HR director, Sonny Valera, have been working hard. Uh, they got a great flyer out. Uh, they've got a number of applicants that they've shared with me. Um, so it's a process. They're trying to find the right fit. Um, it's going through. And so I think the next chief might will look back and say, hey, Ivan's a good guy, but this guy's just this guy or gal is going to be just as good, and, and, and they'll be the chief for their time. When Doug Plack was the chief, uh, and I love Doug Plack. We were great friends. We, we share three common things that we both love, and that's motorcycle riding, fast cars, and our spouses. It doesn't get any better than that, right, for, the, for the, those three things. And we have a great time, and we shared law enforcement and he was the chief for his time i was the chief for my time and i think the chief the new chief whoever he or she is will be the chief for their time and it, that answered my other question which is i was curious whether or not you were having any input into this and it sounds like that at least you're being asked for your opinion yes they are they've asked uh, i love this department i love this city i'm 
I'm retiring from the police department. I am not moving here. I have, I've only been to Stout Grove a couple times. I've never really hiked it. I've, I've only been to Trees Ministry uh, one time. It took me three years to get there. So there's a lot of this community, a lot of the things in our community that make it so enriching that I want to experience. My wife and I love to be outdoors and do different things. So that is where I'm going to be. As you know, I, I, I enjoy, and if the city called me for, for help, I'd be there because I, that's my city family. I love them all to death. Any final words for our audience today? As I wind down my career to my community out there, thank you for allowing me to serve you. I, I've done my best. I, I hope it, it met with your approval. And, uh, and wherever and all of you go, I wish you the best. And thank you again. Well, and let me say thank you, because I really have appreciated being able to see you doing your job up close and personal and uh, and the integrity uh, that you have done it with. So thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. All right. Take care. Stay tuned to KFUG Crescent City, your community radio station. I'm Mike Thornton. This has been Public Process.